still remember like it was yesterday when this man came on the stage and introduced the first iPad. And there were rumors as a stockholder, I, I, I tell you right now, when, when Steve was sick and he looked really frail and thin, he came out on the iPad platform and the Apple platform in New York and he said, he, he quoted Mark Twain, the rumors of my death have been what? Greatly exaggerated. And everybody laughed. But the truth was, it wasn't a rumor. I, I remember coming home and my wife said, Sam, take a minute. <laughs> I was like, why, why, what happened? Take a minute. And then she goes, Steve Jobs dead. I'm like, no. No, I'm not, I wasn't like dying. <laughs> but I mean, I have, I have actually a theory that, that Steve Jobs' actual death was caused by some people switching over to Samsung. You know? So I know some people in our church that's doing that now, and I'm praying for you. Um, but, uh, you know, what, what it shows is this billionaire titan, Pixar and Apple, and you know, the, the, the most valuable company in the world, had everything money could buy. The best doctors, Eastern medicine, Western medicine. He couldn't stop death. So the rumors of his death was actually not exaggerated at all. It was underestimated. And we talked about last week that how life simply is precarious. It's uncertain. But today I want to talk about it's not just precarious and just uncertain. It's actually, if I could put it in a certain way, dangerously precipitous. Oh. It's here one second and gone the next. No matter how much bravado you might have, or will, or strength, sooner or later, you realize you are frail. Life is short, and you are not that strong. And life tests that for you. Last week, I was sharing about this year, how this year has been one of the most difficult years of my life. And I'm sure for a lot of us, this year has been difficult for, for jobs, for faith, for many different reasons. And someone came to me, a couple of people came to me and said, you are so vulnerable, Pastor Sam. Oh, so sweet. Let me give you a hug. I'm like, I'm the Terminator. Back off. You know? Uh, it's like, you're, you're so sweet. I mean, you were going, I had no idea you are going through such a hard time. You know? And, and, and you, you look at that and you go, well, you know, thank you for sharing that. It, it, it's commu it spoke to me. It met with me. And here is what I want to share with you. I think one of the, the, the biggest lessons I've learned this year is not the fact that I need to be more vulnerable to communicate or to connect with people. I've learned that I am vulnerable. There's a difference. that I am human. You know, you can have this resilience faith and you can, you can, you can believe in, in, in immense faith and, and really in res resilience fight and, and run the race. But the truth is, in the end of the day, like Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, I'm, I'm just a jar, jars of clay. I've learned that I am vulnerable. Not the fact that I need to be vulnerable, it's not the fact, I mean, you ever um, witnessed this? I have witnessed this so many times in my life. When you ask someone going to a difficult time um, or, or you get into a fight and you go out, you know, they run out the door because that's what people do when they're upset. I'm leaving. And so what do you do if you have any type of tact? It's actually tact to do this. People learn this. If people walk out your door, you go, screw them, bye. No, you, you go after them, right? You go after them, and you go, what's wrong? And then they get upset at you for asking what's wrong. How many people have ever experienced this before? Say amen if you experienced this. I mean, it's like, what's wrong? They go, nothing is wrong. Why are you asking me if anything's wrong, like something's wrong? I, and I'm like, I don't know, because you just jetted out the door. <laughs> and they're just like, 
no, nothing's wrong. I'm totally fine. Everything is going well. And, and you're like, no, nothing. And you keep, you press in, and they get more upset. And you know what? Eventually, I, I've seen this with men, particularly, that think they're tough guys. Nothing's wrong with me. I never feel anything. I go, no. I, like, hug them. And they're like, get off me, bro. Get off me. I'm like, no, no, come here. Come here. Bro. Uh, uh. I know someone, in particularly in this room, that did this a couple of times. And, and um, not to mention names. But, but, you know, and, and they just start, I mean, men have particularly, I mean, women, they, they could cry at will. If you're especially actress or something, you just, ah, you cry. When you cry, we're just like, let's get out of here. <laughs> it's like, you know, you know you, spiritual warfare, PM, I don't know, but we're leaving. <laughs> um, we're not going to be for, if you're for this. But if, when, when, a, when a man cries, a boy, you, you're just like, okay, okay, we need to be here. This is happens once in a while only. And, and I've seen this with many adolescents, adult males, 40s and 50s, where they just cry and cry. Now, and, they're, and, they're, and they just sob. And, and when I, what I realized at that moment is that it comes to a certain point when you have to begin to embrace that life suck sometimes, and things happen that shake your world. And you've realized that you're not that strong at all or powerful. For me, I think this whole year, and the lesson I learned was that I'm not invincible. And that's why we need each other. And that's the whole meaning behind Advent, people. Who, some, how many people here felt like this, like, like me, where you just felt like no one could understand what you're going through? Say amen if you felt that before. I felt that this year. At, at, the, at the transitions and all the crisis that's going on in my life, let, let, me see, let me tell you what was going on. My wife had Josh. Do you know how much tension a baby needs? It cannot, I told you, I told you before, a baby is useless, right? It's literally useless. Like, you have to hold its head up, or it'll just collapse on the floor and die. And it's useless. So she, she's drawing that attention, and, and, you know, and then, really, the frailty of life. My mentor, who always been there for me, Martin Sanders, one of them. It's the person I usually turn to when I'm in crisis. And you know what? I speak to him, and he's like Yoda. <laughs> I know what you're thinking, you know? You see? And then he says these proverbs, and I dismantle him in the car, and I'm like, ah, I see. And I get perspective. But this time, this year, he couldn't help me. Because his wife was diagnosed with a degenerative disease with no cure. When she was experiencing dementia. So how do you go to your mentor and tell him your sob story when his life might be worse? You know what Paul says, press at every side? That's what I felt like. Who do I tell? Who can I look to? How many people do that when you're in trouble, when you're in crisis? Who can I call? What happens when you have no one to call? And it dawns on us that as Christians, that perhaps maybe that when no one can understand what we're going through, no one could be there for us. That's why Jesus came. Amen? That's Advent, people. The world was dark. Darkness was surrounding the earth. And the first week, four weeks till Christmas, the hope of the world, the light of the world, the Bible says, the fullness of grace and truth, Jesus, 
who will understand our pain, who came to set the captives free, who came to bind up the brokenhearted, is coming. Tell someone, he is coming. No, don't, don't, say, it like, don't say it like that. Come on. Say it cooler. Say, he is coming. Like that, yeah. Say, come on, tell someone, he is coming. That's Advent. He is coming. Today, I want to talk to you about how you can regain a footing, how you can begin to look up again to God this season, how you can find the faith to put your life completely into God's hands again. Because let me ask you a question. How good are you when you take life into your own hands? Don't even answer that. I know the answer. It's a mess. And that's the whole purpose of Christmas. When we take our life into our hands, it becomes a mess. And that's why God came to take this world into his. And the invitation of Christmas is for us to go back into his hands. So I want to answer that question. So let's turn to this text, a very simple passage. I want to start, at, kick off Advent as well with, and um, I think it brings great comfort, it's particularly for me, what the ear has been, and particularly the meaning behind Christmas. Now, so what does it say? Jesus says to the Pharisees in a conversation that my sheep listen to what? My voice. I know them. And they, what? Follow me. I give them eternal life. And, and check out the word J Jesus draws from here. And he says what? And they shall what? Never perish. First word. They shall never perish. No one can what? Snatch them out of my hands. Now, what's the imagery Jesus draws here about the dangers of life? First word, what's the word? Perish. How many people here felt like this year where you were going to perish? Where you're going to expire? And the picture of, of this is, of course, um, you know, when the Bible says, what's the first word here? <clears throat> Read it with me, everyone together in unison. My sheep. I told you that that's not a compliment. You know, you have people you love in your life, and they might be no benefit to you, but, you know, they're your, and you fill in the blank. You know what I'm saying? I have people like that, especially people I mentor. <laughs> you know, and they, go, and they go, I'm so dumb. I'm like, but it's okay. You're my dummy. Right, because isolated, if they're just dummies, they're just dummies. But no, you have special personal embezzlement. No, you're my dummy. I'm patient with you. I love you. You're my dummy. And when, when Jesus says, you're my sheep, sheep is, I told you, known to be really stupid. I mean, I think an ant might be smarter than a sheep. And the brains, I mean, really, in terms of size, is crazy. And when the Bible talks about sheep, it talks about being stupid. Wandering off for, because the grass is greener on the other side. Sheep and humans, very, very parallel. And, and Jesus says, they will not perish, meaning no matter what comes, hazard or danger, which is really predatory, if a lion or a fox or, you know, whatever animal tries to devour the sheep, what Jesus is saying is the shepherd will come and protect them. He'll protect them. They will live. I want you to know you're sitting here today in this seat. No matter what you've gone through, I pray the Holy Spirit would show you what you've gone through and why you're here is because Jesus was protecting you. He was there with you. And check this out. This is what? No one can what? Snatch them out of what? my hands. Because we were talking about, in, in last week, we were talking about the best music of all time, which we're all, what? 
created in what time period? Not, people, pay attention. Say it. When was it? 90s. The 90s. We talked about hammer time. We talked about too legit to quit. That was awesome, right? Too legit to quit. But I got to re remind you people and bring you back to 1989, 1991. When Hammer became famous and iconic for another song. And what was that song? Your generation does not have that. Has no songs. Baby, baby does not compare. <laughs> Justin Bieber does not compare to... Can't touch this. Can't touch it. I mean, it doesn't matter if my son likes can't touch this. Can't touch this. And it became a sensation. Now, what Jesus is saying here is precisely that. And I think that's what God is bringing us back to. He's bringing us back to the reality that no matter what you go through, God's saying to the enemy, to the precariousness of our world, to the brokenness of our world, to our own sin, Jesus is saying, you can't touch this because I'm holding you. Amen? To me, that, that's great, great, powerful hope. No matter how dumb we are, no matter how, what we're going through, and the dots that don't seem to make sense in our life, what if God vertically is looking above and orchestrating our story? Letting us go through the crucible. And yes, it's scary at times and hard at times, but he's, he's holding us. So, how do you regain your, foot, your footing or your faith to completely turn your life? once again, into God's hands. Well, first lesson we learned from it this, what is this. You need to understand because you can't touch this. God's saying you can't touch this. And what? It's just rest in his what? Sovereignty. Tell someone to rest in his sovereignty. Tell them it's all about sovereignty. It's sovereignty. God is sovereign, people. He is not surprised at what we're going through. God is in control. He's got it. He's here right now. And he knows what's going in our life. And he's got it. Now, I want to pray with you right now. I'm not done with my message. You're like, whew, done, finished. No. I want to pray with you right now. Wherever you are, I want you to lift your hands to God. And I want to pray right now that this verse, and we're going to practice a discipline of Advent here, where I'm going to read the scripture, and I'm going to pray that you feel the sovereignty of God, you rest in the sovereignty of God about your life. Whatever you fear, whatever anxiety you have, Whatever turmoil and how much you have failed, how much you tried to take matter into your own hands, and how much of a mess you might be in, I want you to listen to the sovereignty of God in this passage. And Jesus says again, my sheep, listen to my voice. I know them, and they will follow me. I will give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Never perish. Because no one can snatch them out of my hand. Holy Spirit, I want to pray right at this moment <clears throat> that you would show us the bigness of God right now. That you are working in our life legitimately. That you are moving in our life in the midst of all this. And Father, you know exactly what's going on. Will you rest right now in the sovereignty of God? Everybody take a deep 
sigh right now. Take a deep breath. Just breathe it in. Every, all God's people say, uh, didn't that feel good? Right? You're like, oh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what do, I have, what do I have to do? What do I have to do? Oh my gosh, what do I have to face? Am I going to get through this? All these uncertainties, all these what ifs. Sometimes you have to stop, as the psalmist says, you have to be still and know that he is God. And I pray the Holy Spirit today would give you that peace of his sovereignty. Amen? All right, let's move down. Now, now check this out. Jesus just doesn't say, well, you shall never perish. My sheep will never perish, and they will have eternal life, and no one can snatch them out of my hand. But then Jesus repeats himself. My Father, who has what? Given them to me. Tell someone, you're chosen. Don't, no, come on, don't tell them that with disgust. Oh, I can't believe you're chosen. No, tell them, you're chosen. Now, you're not chosen because you're special. <laughs> don't tell them that. <laughs> you're chosen, not because you're special or anything. You're just chosen. You're chosen not because you're good or bad. You're chosen because the Father, you're the Father's child. He created you for his own. You came from him. We talked about this imperishable seed. Anyone that believes in Christ has an imperishable seed, a legitimate work of God in their life. And here Jesus repeats himself and says, the Father has given them to me. Because the Father is working in our life. And then he says, he is greater than all. The Father is the all-compassing power of the universe. There's nothing. He's omniscient, omnipresent. Nothing could frustrate his purpose. He says, and he says again, no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. He's adding this for greater certainty to, to a world that's what? Dangerous and uncertain. He's saying whoever is in the Father's hand. So it's kind of like, you know, you have double defense, protection. Let me tell you how I understand this passage better. When I became a father, because, I mean, naturally, in the, in the natural, I am pretty clumsy. I spilled something yesterday, too. Now when I spill something or break something, my, and then my wife upstairs says, what happened? I just lie. Nothing. I know how to clean up real quick get towels and clean up. I mean, but I just got used to it. In the natural, it's, it's just a part of me. I'm, my, my mind is in the clouds. So, you know, I'm just spilling drinks. It's pretty expensive. I, I just spilled a whole Carmen Macchiato yesterday. The one I bought at Starbucks and brought back home, I spilled it. I was like, oh! But let me tell you, these hands, spiritually. <laughs> That's right. Can't touch this. Spiritually, as a father, when, when, when my sons are in my hand, it's like I'm a gifted surgeon. I could pick their burgers, clean their diapers. These hands are gifted. It's a gifted hand. One time, actually, when Nathan was born, and he was about 15 months, I, I don't do this anymore, just letting you know, but I do have a tendency to wear, like, you know, you know, the Asian socks, they're pretty thin, and I have carpeted uh, stairs. And I usually slip and just, you know, fall, and just slid down the stairs. And I'm, I know this has happened to you, too, okay? People will say, what? That's never, I'm like, this is, uh, this is slippery. One time I was holding Nathan. Now you know why he's the way he is. <laughs> I was holding Nathan 18 months, and I was going down the stairs, and I slipped. My son lifted up in the air. It was like slow motion. <laughs> you know, you have this 20-pound baby that, I mean, if you've ever been to my house, the stairs going down is pretty steep. 
right? It's like more. It's like about ten feet, and in a and. Uh, and I slip, I'm falling down, I'm slitting down, and the baby's up in the air. <laughs> and I thought, okay, and, and let me tell you, this is how you know I'm a, I, I'm a T, INT, INTJ, I think and plan at the same time. In the millisecond that this is happening, I'm thinking, if I don't catch this baby, my wife's going to kill me. <laughs> One, right? That's... You know, if you're a man, you're going to think that no matter what. That's, that's, that's just there. That's happening right there. And, um, and then secondly, it's a fatherly instinct. I was slitting down. I jump up <laughs> while sl slitting down, and the baby is about to fall, and I propel my body, and I catch Nathan. Thank you, thank you. You know those stories about mothers lifting cars? Well, this is better. I mean, I was, I mean, talk about the balance necessary. I mean, I was going, and I caught him, and literally at the last piece of stair that was left, I, and I, I caught him, and Nathan was like, that was fun, you know? I almost had a heart attack. But people, at that moment, as a father, just the instinctive part, of a human father is that you don't want your child to be hurt because of slippy socks. <laughs> well, that's what I told, my, told myself many times. But it's life happens. Things happen. People, how secure do you think God the Father's hands is? If I can do that, nothing is out of out of God's control. Whatever you might think, your problem, your issue, I don't know what it is, but you do. You have a very clear picture in your gut what that might be. That it's too, and you know what? You might not say it's too big for God. You might not say it's too big of a problem, but you do feel like it, and you don't feel like you, you believe it's better in your hands. Let me tell you, God's hand is the safest hand. It's the safest place to be. The Father's heart for you is incredible. And why do you think I did that? Because my son is precious to me. I'm willing to sacrifice my body. I'm willing to be hurt. I don't care. I just want him to be what? Say the word. Say the word. Safe. God wants you to be safe, people. He does. So, how do you find a faith to put your trust in God completely again? Well, lastly, we learn from this passage, what? Read this with me. Precariousness, what? Brings, but our, brings what? Brings faith. Now, if you're going to base your life on probability, life sucks. The world is violent. The world is uncertain. Then you should not have faith except disappointment. You should expect disappointment, and you should expect a crushing of expectation. That should be it. But today, if you realize how precious you are to God the Father, if you realize just a glimpse of that revelation, that he's willing to catch you, and Jesus says, no one can snatch you out of my hand, and then no one can snatch you out of my Father's hand. That's the picture. So picture God the Father and Jesus holding your life. As we close, I feel like the gospel in this passage is a picture of what we used to do when Nathan was pretty young. Now he's kind of heavy. We can't do it anymore. We don't swing him anymore. We might die. And it's a picture of a family. And I want you to know that the gospel is a picture of a family. And you're the child. You and I are the child. Child of God. And 
me and Lydia would hold Dathan's hand. And always, he would what? Want to what? Swing. Now, if I were to tell you, this is a dangerous exercise. Because you could lose your grip. And be like, hey, one, two. And that's it. No more baby. Baby is gone. But what? No, we love him, so we're going to hold him together. And our, both of us, if my wife loses, her, loses his you know, hand, I mean, you just heard my story. Come on. Right? I mean, you have to picture your journey as a Christian, as the father and the son being one in your life, being there for you together. And this is the passage where I want to end. And I and the Father are one. They are one in purpose in keeping us, in forming us, and loving us. And today I want to invite you to step in into his hands. Stand with me and let's pray for that. Holy Spirit, I want to pray for those of us holding on. For those of us that lack vision. Father, I pray today that some of us that have been closing our eyes for so long because we're so scared of the future and so afraid of certain things in our life that if we open our eyes, we'll see that it's God holding on to us. The promise has always been that He will bless you and make you a blessing. Now, that promise is only something that God can keep. It was never that you have to hold on to Him. Now, the only reason you would hold on to God, in spite of all the temptations, in spite of all the storms, the only reason a human holds on to God is because they love God. And that's why, because our love is also precarious. We love Him sometimes and sometimes we don't. We let go, but God never lets go. Today, Father, I want to pray that you would reveal to us your hand in our life. I pray we would see that hand. We would feel that hand. And we would grow confident because of it. Jesus, you're the lover of my soul. Jesus, he will never let me go. You've taken me from the miry clay. Set my feet upon the rock, now I know. Can we sing from the beginning and in the part that says, I will never let him go? Let's sing it with the truth that says, he will never let me go, okay? Jesus, you're the lover of my soul. Jesus, he will never let me go. You've taken me from the miry clay. Set my feet upon the rock. Now I know I love you, I need you, though my world may fall, you'll never let me go, my Savior, my precious friend, I will worship you until the very end. Father, we want to come before you this afternoon. God, I pray that we would feel your hands on ours. Hebrew says, 
to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, in between that period, many of us in this room, some of us have grown cold, apathetic, fearful, because all we see is our turbulence and our issues of our life and the environments that threaten our safety. Go back to the Word of God. He is there. He is present. He is present right now. He's not just going to get you through today. He's going to get you through it all. So will you go to him right now? And will you get vision? Yes, precariousness brings fear. But the Bible says perfect love casts out fear. Father, today I pray that the love of the Father, the fact that we are precious to God, I pray that that would sink in in our heart and it will change the way you look at the world. It would change the way you feel for God. Because the only reason you'll hold on to God is because of love. If you're trying to hold on to God because of obligation, forget about it. Sooner or later, it'll run out. The marriages run out because of obligation. Relationships run out because of obligation. If you're holding on to God because of religion, pretty, pretty soon, or a couple more years, there's no way you can be perfect. There's no way you think you're strong enough to make it. The most powerful source to hold on to God is because he's holding on to you out of love, and the love is returned. And that's why we sing. Jesus, lover of my soul, let's sing it as is, as our prayer together. Would you lift your hands with me? And we'll close our Advent service today. And let's make our response to God. Jesus, lover of my soul. Jesus, you're the lover of my soul. Jesus, I'll never let you go. Jesus, I will never let you go. You've taken me from the miry clay. You set my feet upon a rock. my feet upon the rock. Now I know. I love you. I need you. Though my world may fall, I'll never let you go. My Savior. My closest friend. My closest friend. So, Father, we come before you tonight. And we pray that that, that would be our prayer. I pray that it won't be enough that God loves us, but I pray, God, as Jesus comes into the world and us seeing why, I pray that we would fall in love with God and we would never let him go. That's our prayer, God. We thank you for always holding on to us because of love and we're precious to you. We pray that you would become precious to us. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's give God a clap offering. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week.
time. 